So welcome to the Raw Food Health Empowerment Podcast. Today, I have with me a special guest. Lauren Ornelis is the founder and president of Food Empowerment Project, a vegan food justice nonprofit that promotes veganism, fights for farm workers, works on lack of access to healthy foods in black and brown communities, and encourages people not to buy chocolate sourced from the worst far- forms of child labor, including slavery. She has been active in the animal rights movement since 1987, having started the first high school animal rights group in San Antonio, Texas, and then Action for Animals, a group she launched in college and that is still active in Austin. Well, welcome Lauren to the Raw Food Health Empowerment Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here. I mean, you really made an impression on me during one of Afro Vegan Society's events and talking about, you know, what's going on with farm workers and why, you know, vegans need to pay attention. I mean, we're all, we all eat, regardless if you're vegan or not, we all eat, you know. Exactly. So paying attention to how our food is made, where our food is made, what's going on, um, that's really important. So I really appreciate you and the work that you do over at the Food Empowerment Project. Well, thank you. And thanks for the work that you do. And thanks for listening to these things and not getting defensive and wanting to learn more. And I think that that's what all of us who talk about veganism want people who consume animals to do. So I think it's good for us to always be a reflection of that. Yeah, yeah. So what inspired you to go vegan? Well, I went vegetarian when I was young. Parents got divorced when I was four. And during that time, I mom had to like drop me off at places um, when she had to go to work. And so growing up in Texas, I would see the cows in the field and I would just imagine how horrible it would be to, for them to be a part and it for, to be my fault. And so I, you know, I wasn't able to stick with being vegetarian because we didn't have a lot of money and we had to eat what people gave us. So um, I wasn't able to stick with it. By the time I was 16, I was like, okay, I mean, I'm going to be vegetarian no matter what. And when I was 17, I um, started talking about um, growing up in Texas during what in ecology class, a teacher started showing a slideshow on uh, wildlife management, which was basically uh, hunting. It was basically again in Texas showing why hunting was necessary. And so I was saying there had to be another perspective to this because this just couldn't be right. Like we, it didn't make sense that we would have to kill the deer. And so in a rude way, um, they told me to talk to somebody who cares and then gave me an article about a local animal rights group. So um, that's when I learned about like uh, chicks having the tips of their beaks cut off or eggs. When I learned about everything. So in 88, I saw a talk given by one of my mentors, um, Don Barnes, who was an ex vivisector, grew up in Texas as well hunted eight animals and how he'd gone vegan. And I thought, I can do it then. So kind of like right then and right there, I just went vegan and, you know, gave my sisters my belts and my shoes and I didn't want any of that stuff anymore and then just stopped eating them. So I think it was just like kind of like a slow thing. So this would have been an 88. So it wasn't really out there that much, but just the more I knew that it was possible that I could try to live where I didn't cause harm to non-human animals, it made me want to do it. Yeah, that's so interesting to me that they actually have schooling and logic behind why they need to kill animals. Yeah, I mean, think about like so much that we learn, right, is by some entity that wants us to believe that and and infiltrates our educational system, right? So we have, you know, the dairy industry teaching health. We have white supremacists teaching history, right? I mean, again, I grew up in Texas. So my knowledge of the real world has been a lot different than what I learned in school. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the same thing that this ecology teacher didn't think any, any had no issue with the idea of promoting hunting as a way to help the environment, you know, that there's the control that they have to make us question our compassion, I think, is is pretty riddled. And I think it's our sense of justice as well in school, I think it tends to get undermined. Yeah, that's pretty wild. I'm like shocked. (laughs) 
Wow. So you, I read something um, that you wrote where you talked about working in the nonprofit space and how that put your body under heavy stress to the point where your doctor was telling you to quit. I would love for you to kind of share some information on that and like how you were able to stay the course because now you, you founded this nonprofit and you're still doing a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of educating, you know, which is, is laborious, you know, to keep having to reiterate a lot of, um, you know, tragic stories over and over and over again. So like, how are you able to do this with some balance for your self care? Well, I was working at an animal rights organization and um, the, the founder of the organization was a very cruel person and really sought to undermine people's self-esteem, really um, knew what bu buttons to push to make you feel inadequate and bullied. And eventually um, I started having like really bad heart palpitations and went to the doctor to the, where they connect me up with a um, heart monitor and with a diary for me to keep track of what was happening. And they were able to match up my diary with every time my palpitations got bad. And they were every time I was with that, the founder of the organization, um, who was also the executive director. And um, yeah, their recommendation was you need to quit your job. You know, you, if you want to be healthy, you can't stay here. And because of my, you know, that was an animal rights organization, because of my desire to, my dedication to my campaigns, I was working on animal experimentation, you know, I was working, trying to fight, you know, vivisection, animal testing, circuses, you know, all sorts of stuff that I just couldn't, I couldn't imagine not doing that. And to add to that too, is that I needed a job, right? I needed a job. I just moved out to California and I needed a job. Um, now, when I got into a similar, you know, eventually I left the organization. When I got into a similar situation with another animal rights group, um, I left that job in four, four months, right? So I stayed in that first job four years, but I learned the second time, I'm not going to go through this again, right? So I don't feel like I'm the best person always to talk about self-care because it's something I'm still learning to do, right? Like I'm still it's a, still a struggle. I feel like I was raised with the 1980s perspective of the animal rights movement, which was sacrifice and give up everything for non-human animals, which meant you work all the time. You know, you try to be a martyr for the cause. Mm -hmm. And what I love is being around people who aren't like me mm -hmm. and actually learning the, they have interests, like they like art or they like making jewelry or something like that. And I got involved in animal rights when I was 17. Yeah. And now I'm 51. So I had I had no ability to grow any outside interest except for my political outside interest, which I love. I love my I love politics. Mm -hmm. um, so I always feel like my job now is really just to make sure that other people don't go down that path. Um, and to really encourage those types of outside interests that they have. For self-care for me, like I said, I mean, I believe in need therapy. <laughs> you know, I mean therapy is yeah. very important. Um, and I know that I love this new generation again for being like, hey, that's nothing to be ashamed of. And I really commend uh, them and you all for creating that type of atmosphere that I don't feel bad saying that, you know, because mm -hmm. there's such a stigma about needing those types of things that is, is lifting away slowly. Now, would my family be thrilled? I don't know, but, you know, <laughs> that I'm open about it so publicly, but you know, I think it's important. I think also having people around you who support you, you know, who generally literally want you to succeed. Yeah. Um, we, we are in a very competitive movement, unfortunately, and we don't always see that. Um, but I know I feel better when I'm generally excited for young um, black and brown women who are getting there in this, this vegan realm because it's really inspiring um and i think that yeah self-care is so hard for me it's still it's literally something that i'm learning and i'm thankful to my younger colleagues that i work with who um are exemplifying that but i think i have a great partner he's very supportive and you know helps me out um but i think that having outside interest is something that is really important that people should have taking that time to rest. 
I know that that nap ministry organization or Instagram is very good about that. And I'm trying to learn that it's, it's a revolutionary act and I am anti-capitalist, but somehow I'm, this is still instilled in me about working all the time. So it's a struggle, but I, I hope that anybody who's like me out there um, knows that we got to just keep trying. I love the points that you made about having outside interests. That's super important. And nap ministry, love them. <laughs> Cause they're like, fearlessly, we are taking naps. And you know what? The woman, um, Ariana Huffington, of Huffington Post. She wrote a whole book about how dangerous lack of sleep has become this hustle, 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 and go, go, go. And a lot of the things that you've put out there on social media and on the blog at Food Empowerment Project about what's happening in the vegan space within vegan nonprofits, like I see it in other nonprofits. It's just a nonprofit thing. Mm -hmm. Like everyone's really passionate about their cause and it, it, the cause goes before them and it, to me, like, I like that you mentioned white supremacy, because I feel like that's almost the embodiment of white supremacy, you right. know, because it's like, you are telling people what to do, but you yourself are not really doing the thing, right? And so <laughs> that's that white savior, you mm -hmm. know, kind of complex and all this stuff wrapped up into one. In my in my opinion, maybe you I'm know, stretching the definition. No, but I, I actually think that you're on a good track there in the sense, right? If you think about a lot of nonprofits, and fortunately, overwhelmingly are run by white people, um, predominantly men, but I would put white women in a similar category, given my history. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that, and so for you to sacrifice everything it is about yourself, is okay by them, right? Like if we're always constantly giving, and I think that that's where we get taken advantage of, right? It's because we care, because we wanna make the world a better place, because we want less harm to come to human and non-human animals. Somehow it's okay that we ourselves exploit it because they can always say they have it worse, you know? And I feel like, you know, I was in a, a situation with a job um, before and like, I wanted to be like, but you know what, the people that I'm advocating for, they wouldn't be okay with me being treated this way mm -hmm. because they would know I don't want that for them. They're not going to want it for me either. Yeah. So anyway, I love your track on that. I, I don't think it's a stretch. I think that there's a colonist, Western capitalist, white supremacist uh, platform that we are handed in life. Um, and this is what we're supposed to follow. And again, the the kick-ass generation of you all that's younger is saying no I don't think so and that's exactly how it should be yeah so I'm hopeful to see what happens uh in the next five to ten years because I don't think anything's going to change because like you said a lot of them are one by white I know nonprofits run by black people but the board oh. you know I don't know if the because the board I'm learning, they dictate all the things, you know? And, and that's why I very much believe that we need to be running our own organizations mm -hmm. from the beginning. And we need to get as much support. So our board is made up of people who look like us. Yeah. Reflective of the community, at least, you know, at the bare minimum, because I think if the board is running things, then it, there becomes a, like a hypocrisy that happens in the nonprofit space, you know, cause they're running with this kind of like corporate mentality of like, you know, work yourself to the bone, but mm -hmm. we're supposed to be building healthy communities here. You know, <laughs> that's not healthy. Exactly. You know, exactly. so yeah. So that's, I, I, I just, I'm glad that you've opened the conversation. You even wrote a blog post on how nonprofits should um, unionize, which I thought was so interesting. And that there, there actually are a few nonprofits who've done that, which kudos to them, because I know that's like a huge deal. Like I really doubt some of the major players in the nonprofit space will do that. Um, Cause it seems even like in terms of like diversity, equity, inclusion, like really doing that for real, for real, like within their organizations is hard, even mm -hmm. though that's what they promote. You know? mm -hmm. I, <laughs> so. Yeah, you'll hear me. I mean, I would way rather any time and men or money that's put into that instead be given to black and brown people who have an eye towards social justice and veganism and animal rights or whatever, and let them start their own groups. Yeah. Because it's just, it's just, I really feel like we need to be running our own organizations and have our own boards. And 
not trying to change an organization that maybe is never going to be accepting of things being any differently, regardless of what they say and regardless of how much training they get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, lots to think about and discuss and strategizing because I've heard, I think it's Audrey Lord's quote that says you can't break down the master's house with the master's tools or something like that. I probably messed it up, but, yeah, <laughs> but that's basically, yeah, yeah, that's basically what you're speaking to. So um, right now, all the things that you're working on within the food empowerment project is to support farm workers, right? And with a focus on our food system. So what do you think people need to know right now about our food system? Like, what are we not getting that we should get? Well, I think that we probably should remember that our food system was never made to benefit black and brown people. It was made to benefit off of our backs, off of our suffering. Um, and so the current system that exists is probably gonna always look that way. So a new system needs to be created that is made so that um, we are self-reliant and any system that comes about looks to benefit us and our communities, not corporations. So for us, that looks like growing your own food. It looks like um, worker-owned cooperatives. Um, you know, until we're in that place, um, you know, what we need to remember is until we're in that place, farm workers um, who, unless you grow all your own food, you're eating food that farm workers pick and they are some of the most abused workers, in the US, suffering from a wide range of abuses, um, including wage theft, sexual harassment, um, children working. Uh, you have many who experience homelessness, even though they're working all the time, they still don't make enough money. Um, to the fact that many of them right now are working in the heat. Um, we had farm workers working in the fires. So um, we need to amplify the voices and the needs of farm workers. We need to show solidarity with them as vegans, even especially if you're advocating for other people to go vegan, um, you need to definitely put this on your radar as well, that we need to amplify the needs of farm workers. They have boycotts they've called. We need to support their boycotts. We need to support legislation um, that they want us to support. Uh, we need to remember as vegans as well that, you know, when we look at the current food system that not everybody has equal access to healthy foods. Um, the black, brown and indigenous communities in this country do not have anywhere near uh, the same access to healthy foods as the wider, more affluent communities. So it's not that easy for anybody to go vegan, um, that we need to fight for equity and, and justice. And one of the ways we can do that is by pushing for living wages, making sure that everybody has the right, that can afford this healthy food. So as part, as far as I'm concerned, as part of promoting veganism is advocating for living wages, is making sure that we're speaking out about these other issues because in our work and research we've done in communities is that uh, the food apartheid is actually existing primarily because of the cost of the food even more than proximity. Mm. So people just can't afford it. We need to remember, you know, we have a current campaign against Safeway Grocery Store, which goes under various names around the country, um, including Lucky and Bonds, and um, oh, it's clutching mm -hmm. my pearls. <laughs> I actually <laughs> like Vons. Oh my goodness. Vons is owned by, so Safeway is owned by Albertsons and it's so they're all owned by Albertsons. And basically what they've done is they have placed um, primarily in black and brown communities and where older people are living. They mm -hmm. have placed restrictive deeds where their former grocery stores were saying no grocery store can move in for a certain number of years. So the communities were working in, there was one located in downtown, they relocated miles away, and they said no grocery store could move in that area for 15 years, depriving mm. that community from having access to healthy foods. So I think it's important when we look at something specifically like that, that we realize that the food situation isn't what it is in this country by accident. These are deliberate attempts to harm the health of communities. Mm. And that we, you know, by being vegan and all this, we make our individual choices, but we need to help change the system by using our collective voices to demand change to policymakers, to corporations, and also empowering our own communities. So 
Thank you so much for sharing all of that, because I know most people don't know, like the thing about the grocery stores creating these restrictive deeds about, I literally just found out about that within the last seven days. Um, there's so much we don't know. Like this type of stuff doesn't get on mainstream media. So like, I guess I wanna know, like since you've been running Food Empowerment Project and talking about all this important stuff, what kind of media responses have you gotten? Like, what's the support like? Cause I feel like all the vegan activists Black Lives Matter activists. I mean, we should be still engaging in our activism, but we also need to be supporting this type of work. Like we need to be doing this. This is a health equity issue. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that the media is fickle. Um, they are, you know, sometimes we'll get exposure on like what Safeway is doing, but a lot of times they're seen as advertisers, right? So you don't want to go after your advertisers. So we haven't got much I think Marketplace or one of the NPR stations did something on it, but no mainstream media, no matter how much we try to talk about it, really covers it. Now, Vallejo, California, the community we worked in, it made front page of their paper because they've been talking about what Safeway did to their community for a long time now. Hmm. So, um, but we don't, you know, we don't get a lot of support. I mean, I founded the organization, sorry, in 2007. And, you know, we hired our first full-time employee in September of 2016. Um, you know, and there's organizations that are far smaller than, uh, younger than us, but are much larger. And, I, and that's pretty easy, right? Because we're talking about human and non-human animals. Mm -hmm. And that just doesn't get the same type of um, reaction than just talking about one of the issues. Cause you'll have vegans who don't want their money to go to human rights issues. And you may have people who support farm worker justice, but aren't vegan. So I always like that our supporters are like a very special group of people <laughs> who understand how this is all connected and super important. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, but you know, I mean, I think it's a matter of just trying to get the word out as much as we possibly can um, through people who support our work, you know, like on social media or sharing pages on our website, sharing our petitions and things like that. So those, so like, if you were to have your top three asks from the folks listening, cause I already know some people that I'm thinking of that want to support all of the work that you're doing. Like what would the oh, top three you. asks? Of course, donations, right? Donations, <laughs> and we'll have a link obviously. in the, in the show notes. So people know where to go so they can donate to your work. What, what other Thank two you. top two asks would you have? Um, I would say, you know, use our chocolate list. Trying to buy chocolate isn't sourced from more slavery and child labor is the most prevalent. That's another issue that doesn't, it's getting more exposure than it used to, but I feel like the more vegans talk about it and care about it, the more we're going to get some of the vegan companies to be consistent and not look at just because it's vegan. You know, we say just because it's vegan doesn't mean it's cruelty free, that we can try to get some consistency within our own movements mm -hmm. um, to talk about these issues. And I think that, you know, my third ask, what would my third ask be? Um, I think overwhelmingly is just to be open-minded about these things and, and just remember that as much as we want people to be open-minded to what we're telling them about non-human animals or about veganism, that we need to be that way about human rights issues and understand how they truly are connected and just listen. You know, we want people to listen to us about what's happening with non-human animals. And I think that we need to do that as well when it comes to human rights abuses. I think that unfortunately there's a lot of ignorance and racism in the animal movement, right? I mean, there just, there just is. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess I'm just thinking how sad that makes me right now that it's just, it's just the- <laughs> Yeah. Like a lot of the things you just said are, you know, it's kind of shocking to me that a vegan chocolate company would have child labor. Like, you know, like, like I just would expect you to be a conscious company all around, you know? And so now I'm recognizing even my own ignorance because I know, like, I talk a lot on the show about how people assume a food is safe just because it's in the grocery store. But yeah. that's like myself, now I'm seeing in myself, I assume 
because the company's vegan, that they're paying their employees right, that they're treating them right, that they're sourcing appropriately. And apparently that's not the case. I really appreciate you guys for being a watchdog because I think we do need to hold people accountable. You know, um, that's so important. Like I'm all for conscious capitalism. The the thing is, I think that just people, we don't have like the time all the to do all the research. And that's why we try to make it easier for people. Like there's a company that you like that isn't on our chocolate list, send us their name and we'll contact them. You know, like we want people to eat their ethics. We know many people want to eat their ethics. They want to eat their values and what it is that they believe in. They don't always have that luxury of time. So we try to create that, um, those resources for people. But I think that um, there's more out there. There's more to do. And we don't want, you know, people to feel completely overwhelmed, right? Like that's the most thing I hear is like, I'm making vegan dis- veganism difficult for people because I bring up things like chocolate. And I'm like, well, to me, it's about consistency. It's about my values of not wanting to cause harm to either one. Mm-hmm. But I, I hear what they're saying, but I don't think that... Um, we should feel so overwhelmed by it. We should be excited to be able to have opportunities to where we can create change because there's so many horrible things in the world that we can't do anything about. But when it comes to our food, we actually have the ability several times a day, if you have that privilege to eat several times a day, um, to make decisions, to take a look at where your food is coming from and make sure you're not supporting things that you don't believe in. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys are also running a school supply drive. So you want to tell me about that and like when it's happening? Yes. I wasn't sure if um, this was when this was going to air, but yeah, we're currently doing a school supply drive for the children of farm workers. And we started doing this because I went on a reality tour of where farm workers um, lived and where they worked. And we were asked to bring things for the kids and we brought school supplies. And this 13 year old boy ran to this packet of pencils and was so excited about pencils. And I thought, these kids are eager for their education. They're eager to succeed. And so we started doing the school supply drive to you know, help their parents one less thing that we can, you know, we can do. I see it you know, not as an act of charity, but as a way to give back to people who are being treated wrong, yeah. who aren't being, you know, I, the systems are treating them unfairly. And I can't, that's a slow process, but what could we do right now? And that's help their children succeed because that's who the vast majority are doing things for us for their children to have a better life. So mm-hmm. um, we actually didn't meet our goal for the school supply drive. So we're actually extending it until um, July 19th. Okay. Um, we're trying to collect, um, I think we still have like 550 backpacks we need. So we're asking people to either send in a donation or send in brand new backpacks. And we do have some criteria on our website for those backpacks. Um, But basically we have kids, we fill them with school supplies and then we take them to the communities. This year, we're also doing water bottles because of COVID, a lot of the water fountains aren't working um, because of the the spread of COVID. So we're actually gonna be, our hope is to include water bottles for the kids this year. And we've been doing this every year for several years now. And um, we have some amazing videos and photos of the excited children as they get their school supplies. Um, on our website. I can't wait to see that. You should. So I adorable. love shopping for school supplies. So I can't right? I'm an office supply <laughs> addict. So yeah. Yes. <laughs> I was like, I would so work at Staples. Like I just <laughs> love being in the space. You know? <laughs> totally. I know. And it's fun because you get to pick out cute little backpacks and everything. Yeah. It's, it's so much fun. That's so cool. So yeah, I'll make sure this definitely goes out before then. So everyone gets an opportunity to contribute. And where can folks connect with you and your organization online? You can just shout it out. And of course, we'll have the links on the show notes. Sure. We have foodispower.org, which is our main website, which has a ton of information on it. And that's in English and in Spanish. We also have veganmexicanfood.com, which is in English and in Spanish, veganfilipinofood.com, which is in English and Tagalog and veganlaofood.com, which is in English and will soon be in Lao. And we're also on social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And then you can always just email. Um, If you have more questions or you want information or anything, we can help you with. 